Hello, friends, and welcome to the Cinemondo podcast with just me. Um, I've been talking about Decalogue, which is a uh, Polish television series, a 10-part television series from 1988 uh, by Krzysztof Krzyzlowski. Um Amazing filmmaker, amazing storyteller, and this series is pretty well known, but I had not seen it until now. It's a... Um, 10 episode anthology that takes place in the same, mostly in the same apartment complex in uh, a very bleak, bleakly depicted um, Soviet communist era, um, brutalist, overcast, kind of colorless communist um, world where not very many people in the series seem very happy. Uh, I'll put it that way. It's it's a very fairly bleak series, kind of grim and a little depressing, but that is not to say as I keep saying, that is not to say you should not watch it. It's it's ultimately very rewarding um as far as a story, a, a kind of story that makes you think. Each episode makes you think about a moral or ethical dilemma or a choice that was made like a um you know these kind of questions where, you know, does the does the is the good of one outweighs the or no the good of the many outweighs the needs of the one you know that thing Mr. Spock said. Um, you get those kind of questions here of, like whether or not your choice was an ethical choice or not, and and more importantly, I think what the series does is it gives you the option of judging the characters. Um, I've used this before as an analogy, looking through the window, which I think a lot of movies give us that superpower to be able to look through a window at the lives of other people and you see their intimate times, you see them alone, you, you sometimes hear their thoughts, you follow them in and out of their situations and you see the secret things that they do through film and that's sort of a basic quality of film that I don't know if we think about that all the time when we're watching a movie but we are in fact watching someone else's life in a very intimate way and this series really sort of points that out um, I think it gives us an opportunity to see maybe how people think about analyze and decide what choices they need to make and you don't always make a choice that's you know, very ethical. Sometimes you do things that are not ethical. I guess all of us have done little things like that, but you know, we 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 justify them or we say it's not that bad, or you know, there's people that are worse, you know. But there there are issues in this series that make you feel make you feel like you're analyzing those kinds of things, those kinds of situations which I think is really fascinating because normally we get an adventure story when we watch a, a show or a, you know, somebody's quest, somebody's character arc is taking them to enlightenment or they learn something or they become a better person or they find the thing they're looking for or they don't find the thing they're looking for but they realize they've had something better all along. Those kinds of things that we're used to seeing. This series doesn't necessarily, de doesn't necessarily deliver that kind of story. We're seeing just moments in a person's life where they're faced with a um, where, the, where they're faced with a difficult situation, and today I'm going to talk about the final episode, um, Decalogue Ten. It's the final one, and unusually, you I mean, with a series like this, you expect we once again have our expectations. You would think that with a ten part series, you would be guided through. A kind of a, um, a story arc, an overall arc of feeling where the final episode would be the blowout. It would be the epic, you know, it would be the Avengers Endgame, you know, where something really big and epic would happen. But contrary to that, this series ends on a sort of a light note. The, all the other nine episodes have been rather grim and, and dark. Um, and now we get one, the, the very last one is a bit lighter. It's still a little grim. There's still some, some grimness to it in some ways. But ultimately, it's not about the grimness. It's about, uh, it's about um, a process in a, in a couple of guys' life. 
uh, lives. It, it starts off, you know, in the in the grim world of Decalogue uh, of of a death. Somebody dies. The father, two brothers come together at the funeral. Very different brothers. One is a regular guy, you know, with a wife and a family. The other one is kind of the loose cannon type of brother who is, uh, he's in a punk rock band and he's kind of just living that sort of rock and roll lifestyle. The two of them get together and um, after the father dies, they go to his apartment and they find that he has a stamp collection that is worth a crazy amount of money. But they, they, um, they start going about their 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 dealings with this stamp collection in kind of a strange way. They they um, they're not very responsible with it at first, and then later something happens, and and they get kind of ripped off. But then one of the brothers figures out a pretty clever way to get it back from the person that scammed it from them. Um, they find that other people are trying to scam them out of of the stamp collection. Somebody comes around to the house and says, you know, your father owed me a lot of money, but there might be something around the apartment that I could take that would compensate, you know, and they're thinking, you know, this guy knows about the stamp collection. And he's trying to rip us off. And and then the stamp dealer that they deal with is, is shady. And there's all these, these sort of machinations of uh, deceit and, People trying to scam people and and trying to get this stamp collection, and they end up dealing with this stamp dealer, this sort of shady stamp, uh, rare stamp dealer, in a way that that they you don't really know why they want to do it at this point, but they the stamp collection is very valuable, but there are a couple of pieces in their collection where they have a a, a small set. And they're missing one and they try they're like you know if we had that extra one it would be worth even more so they try to figure out a way to get that final stamp to complete the collection to raise the value and it's that it's that seems like that mentality of uh of of you know that las vegas v mentality where you're where you win a little bit of money and you're like ah i'm on a roll i'm gonna make more money since i'm on this roll I'm going to take my winnings and I'm going to try to Im increase my winnings. And it's not always a good idea. Sometimes it's good to just sort of take what you got and, and go with it. But they're trying to sort of enhance the collection, it seems, so that they can make more money with it. So they make this deal with this shady stamp dealer to try to get the final piece of this one particular run of stamps. And it involves dealing with another stamp dealer who wants a certain stamp, which this, which someone else has. And then somebody else has a different stamp. And the stamp dealer says, actually, I have that stamp. And I will give you that stamp. Then you can trade it with this guy for another one. And then you tr and then take that one and trade it with this other guy. And he'll give you the one you want. It's a it sounds weird. It's like, but he's like, but you're the one that needs that final stamp. And so they're saying, okay, but what do we have to give you? And the guy says, my daughter is very sick and she needs a kidney. So that is the big, you, you know, that's the moment when, uh, the, you know, the reoccurring character that I've, that I've talked about that seems to be in every episode He's in. He's not in two episodes. This is one of the episodes that he does not appear in. Um, but it seems like maybe he would have been walking past at that point and kind of looked over or whatever to you know like okay here's your here's your moment. Don't uh, make the wrong choice. But the guy decides to go ahead and go through with the the surgery to get that stamp from the stamp dealer, which he can then trade with someone else, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, to get the one they need to complete their their um, sequence in this stamp collection. Kind of complicated. But um, after all of this, when he's done and he's coming home from the hospital, his brother informs him that they've been robbed. Everything is gone. 
all they have is that one stamp. All they have is the stamp that he, the, the final piece of the series, which they no longer have. So all they have is this one stamp, which on its own is not worth very much. So that is their situation. You try to, in, you try to sort of increase your, your bet, you know, you, you bet a little bit more and a little bit more because you think you're, you're going to make more, you know, you're going to turn this much into that much. Not always a great idea. That's the interpretation of it that I get and uh, out of the story. But then again, this story actually has a kind of a fun, sort of a nice ending. And it's the ending of the entire series, which is interesting. Because the two brothers make another choice in this episode. Each on their own, they make another ethical dilemma choice. Each one of them goes to the police and says, I think you should check my brother out because of this robbery. And the reason I think so is because of this, then this, and this. And the policeman is like, interesting. And then the other brother wants to speak to the police. And he says, you know, I feel terrible about saying this, but I think you need to take a look at my brother because of this and this and this and this. And the policeman is like, interesting, okay. So later in the story, the two brothers are hanging around the post office and one of them is looking at the stamps in the, in the stamp rack, you know, the new stamps, the basically worthless stamps. And he's kind of ironically looking at them like, you know, you imagine he's probably thinking, these aren't worth anything, you know, and, and uh, compared to what we had, what we had in our hands just a short while ago. And interestingly, the worker at the post office, the guy at the post office selling him the stamps, is a character from an earlier episode. If you remember, I was talking about the um, episode number six, where you had the guy who worked at the post office who was spying on his neighbor. Um, he shows up as the guy at the post office selling, selling him the stamps, selling the brother the, um, you know, the current postage stamps. So anyway, at the very end of the story, um, which is kind of the touching part, and um, usually in these episodes, the, the last, the final, um, the final moment is kind of heavy and profound. And in a way, this one is too, um, but in its own way, it's, uh, it's the, one of the brothers goes to the dad's apartment and he turns, he comes in and he turns on the light and his brother is sitting there and they've had sort of a falling out, you know, and that's why they sort of turned on each other with the police. But now the brother is there and, you know, the one brother comes in and he sees his brother there looking at something on the table and he's like, I did a terrible thing. And I, 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 and the other brother says, I did too. And, and then they, kind of confess to each other. I told the police that they should look in, into you. And the other brother says, I did the same thing. So they both kind of realize, you know what, it's not worth it. I, I, that, that's my impression. It's not, it doesn't have that s swell of music and the, and the final like dialogue about, oh, you know, brotherhood is worth more than any old stamp, you know. They don't do that. They had a, a much better... Um, a much better way of ending it. He goes up to his, his brother and he says, what are you looking at? And his brother is looking at these three postage stamps that he just bought at the post office. And he's basically just pondering them, you know, kind of ruminating about what's happened. You know, they lost everything because they got a little greedy. And he's looking at these three stamps and his brother looks at the stamps and kind of smiles and reaches into his pocket and he pulls out the three identical stamps, the, the three stamps that are um, that he bought at the post office and he bought the same stamps at the post office. And they look at him and he says, they look at each other and they say, it's a series, which is what they were, you know, they were trying to complete their series before. And they start laughing and they there's this great shot where their two heads kind of come together and they're both just looking, they're over these stamps and they're laughing and their laughter kind of, you know, the air from their mouths when they're laughing blows the stamps away around on the table. And it just sort of, I don't know, underlines the worthlessness of these current postage stamps. And the end of, 
of whatever else there is besides their brotherhood, you know, and they, you realize that they really do like each other and they, they just went through this nightmare, even though they're very different from each other, they're still brothers. And in this story, interestingly, there wasn't a whole lot of that aggression between brothers that you see in a lot of stories or, you know, that sort of angsty relationship of one saying you're irresponsible. And it's like, well, you're boring. And, you know, they didn't go on those routes that you would expect you you kind of get the feeling that they just grew up together and they know each other and it's not weird for this guy's brother to be in a rock band and his he's not you know down on his brother for having a normal straight guy life you know and um he's not um they don't condemn each other they don't antagonize each other over their life choices it doesn't seem you know they don't uh, do that, which you might expect from a story like this. Um, the um, the interesting thing about the ending too is that you you feel like it ha it's it's sort of a happy ending, <laughs> even though they lost their big fortune and their you know their stamp collection and everything. One thing they do see at the end, the thing that makes them realize um, that something that it wasn't the brother was they both see the, the sort of shady characters in a way, they see them across the street in a way that suggests that they knew each other and you're thinking, and they also have a similar kind of dog that they had gotten as a guard dog. Anyway, it's, it's a little bit um, hard to explain completely without going into too much detail, but they look across the street and they realize those guys scammed us. They, they conned us so that they could rob that apartment. And that's my impression of it. It looks as though they realized that. So you imagine after the very, you know, the very fade to black at the end, at the very end, you imagine that they probably went to the police, the policemen. They probably both got together, went to the police and said, look, I'm sorry I said I suspect my brother, but we both witnessed something that may be of interest to you. And, the, you know, you can imagine, I'm, I'm speculating this was not in the script, not in the show, but you can imagine that the police went and found those bad guys and they still had the stamp collection and they got it and gave it back to the brothers. And there was a even happier ending after the ending of the ending. That's what I think about sometimes, you know, like how did it, what happened after it ended? Anyway, I tried to do that with this because I wanted to make their lives better because so many of these stories had these grim, sad lives. These people who lived these sort of gray lives that that just weren't based on happiness. And I keep saying that a lot of entertainment that we see seems to be about the pursuit of happiness or the, the state of general happiness. Like uh, people are the default state of, you know, the typical American is happiness. And in this series, we see the situation and the time, the place and the time that this was made. And you realize that there are times when people were ju just generally, I suppose, generally not focused on their own happiness. They were focused on, on uh, going to work and running through their, you know, getting through their lives and just doing what they're supposed to do and going to sleep and waking up and doing it again. Um, that's the impression I get. I feel like the, the stories show us what life was like at that time in that place, in a, in a way that I guess the filmmakers were trying to address the issues that, you know, those issues of sort of sadness and almost like the, like, what's the point of life? You know, there's a, there's a bit of that in there. But I hate to sound like I'm, I'm getting, you know, being sort of, uh, you know, down on this series for being depressing or overly depre overly sad or, or dismal, you know, or grim or whatever. It's really not. I mean, there are moments in here where people smile and, and they seem like they're enjoying certain pursuits in their lives. But in general, it, it, the, the series seems to be about sad choices and sadness and... And, and in some cases, regret and the kind of unful something is sort of unfulfilled. Something is not quite happening the way it should be happening. And, and people just sort of dealing with it, basically just rolling with it, 
get used to it, go on with your life. And those ethical questions, in the, in the middle of all that sort of sadness, you still have to hang on to your sense of decency and your, your dignity and your humanity. All those things too, even though someone's life might be dark and grim, like I've been saying, there was also that, there's also those, the, those ethical moments, those questions that make you realize that the filmmakers were, are, are quite concerned about issues of eth ethics and, and uh, morals and morality and goodness and badness and right and wrong and all those things. In that respect, it's a really interesting series because that's, that is the quest of this series. The whole 10 episodes seems to be about forming opinions about the, you know, and judgments about the rightness and the wrongness and the, and what's the right choice and how do we always make these good choices or do we always make good choices in our lives? And what if we don't? And what if we, you know, what if we sort of subvert our, our greed and our, our bad feelings and our bad ethics and our bad choices and kind of figure out better ways to, to organize our daily uh, choices, you know, these choices that we make, which I think those moments of choices, those ethical choices are kind of marked in the series by the appearance of that reoccurring, you know, Christ-like character that keeps popping up at those moments. And uh, there's always a bit of eye contact between the, the character of the story and that reoccurring Christ-like character, as though... The filmmakers are saying, he is watching, he is watching you. You know, that feeling that we get when we do something bad, you know, when we maybe feel compelled to, to uh, do something we're not supposed to do. Some of us may feel like somebody is up there watching us and we shouldn't do it because we're going to get judged or punished or something like that. But there's a feeling I think is maybe built in, maybe default feeling that there is some sort of perhaps outside force with a lot of people feel that way. Some people don't, but some people feel like there's something, someone out there who is looking down and watching you, specifically you, <laughs> and making sure that, you know, when you do something bad, they're like, no, that's bad. And that feeling, I think, is what keeps people in some, in some cases, keeps people on the straight line, you know, unfortunately they need that feeling. Anyway, there's a lot of big philosophical existential questions surrounding this series. I've kind of touched on some of them. I'm, you know, unfortunately I'm not very smart, so I can't go too deeply into the meanings and the, and the depths of the story. I can only go so far. And that's my interpretation of the series. Um, I hope you've, I hope you've been kind of watching along with me and, um, and enjoying it as much as I did. I thought it was a brilliant series. Every every episode has its own uh, it has its own uh, world. I mean, it depicts an entire world of of, of these characters, the, the characters who are in it. It shows you their life in a really intimate and involving, engaging way. I felt like each episode, even though it was an hour long, I felt like I had spent more time with those people. Not that it felt long, like it was slogging through something. But, but that so much was revealed about them so effortlessly by the filmmakers that I felt like I knew these characters and I felt like it wasn't all of a sudden that I knew the characters. I felt like I was gradually, gradually, you know, let into their lives and their personalities and their motives, their motivations, their feelings were all revealed to me through the course of this one hour episode. In a, in a really brilliant way. You really like these people or you are fascinated by them. You don't necessarily like them all. But in this final episode, you really do like the two brothers. I've, I kept thinking, you know, during this, this episode, wouldn't it, be, wouldn't it have been great if there was a whole series about those two brothers because they were so funny together. They, this is almost, some people have described this episode as a dark comedy. And there are sort of comical elements in it. Um, they sort of are, a, you know, you kind of feel sorry for them a little bit. They kind of make bad choices and bad decisions. They're kind of like a, a comedy duo. There's the, you know, the, the, the crazy rock and roll brother. And then there's the, you know, the straight laced brother with the family and, and, you know, the normal life. 
And the two of them, their lives kind of intersect because they're brothers and they're brought together into this situation that they don't handle very well. And you just, I, you just like them. You want them to, uh, you want to see more of them after this is over. I felt like, God, I wish there was another, another episode with those brothers. Cause they were, they were, uh, they were interesting and funny. And uh, the two performers, again, the cast incredible on this show. Cinematography is amazing. The pacing, the choices, the editorial choices, the script, of course, is great, but I'm reading subtitles, so there's a little bit of a disconnect there with the script, but I'm getting the story. Um, but the cinematography is incredible. Different cinematographer for every episode, except for two who had the same one. But they all had a very contemporary look. Like I've said before, they looked like they could have been shot yesterday. I mean, if you told me this was a brand new series that just takes place in 1988, I would believe you because to me it had the look of of a very very contemporary production beautifully beautifully produced the the shooting the the compositions the editorial choices to hold on certain things for a long time to let you feel it um the way that the camera is used to show you a space you really get the feeling of of the room that you're in and where the people are in the room and how they're moving around. It, there's, a, there's a lot of attention to that kind of detail. So it really puts you in the space. It puts you in that location. The whole series was like that, beautifully shot. And um, I highly recommend this series. I think it's, I saw an episode of the Criteria thing on YouTube where uh, different people go into the Criteria closet, you know, I think, you, I think you've seen it, and they pick out all their favorite movies from that uh, distribution company. Um, and I remember not long ago, I saw Patton Oswalt do one, and he pulled down a Decalogue. He said, ah, oh, this is this is incredible. Watch this. He said he felt, uh, after he watched it, he said he felt like he was changed. So that's one of the things that triggered me to want to see it. Not Not that I felt like I needed to change, <laughs> but because I like Patton Oswalt and I think, you know, if he likes it, there's probably something there. Um, and I like recommendations. Hopefully this series of videos served as a bit of a recommendation. Um, I highly recommend it. It's an amazing series. It's one I think to study. I might actually go back and watch a few of them again. Um, but they're, they're, um, in some ways, not uh, not easy. It's not uh, it's not easy, fun stuff. It's not lighthearted. You really have to pay attention. Obviously, us English speaking and other language speaking people um, need to pay attention because of the subtitles and all that. But I think it's definitely um, worthy of your full attention. There's a lot of details in here. I think the filmmaker didn't. There's nothing extraneous. I think a lot of the things that look like they might be symbols probably are symbolic or intentional and um i just i can't recommend it enough i think it's a fantastic uh work of art it's a 10-part film i think um a series but i also feel like it's a it's a single work that carries you through emotionally it carries you through some uh, a world you know it carries you through warsaw 1988 and the people that inhabit this apartment apartment complex, and the, the 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 dilemmas and the moral situations and the and the ethical puzzles that they face. Um, I could go on and on, obviously, and I think I'll stop right about here and say thank you for joining me for this uh, ten part journey through a Decalogue um, by Krzysztof Krzyslowski. Um, uh, and thank you so much for uh, making it all the way through if you did. Uh, <laughs> I'll talk to you again real soon.